Um, so I'm not just, I was thinking of all these dates and then there's this uh, you know, lovely uh, sort of you know, whimsical, uh, irreverent uh, book uh, as she goes all the way back to 1930 actually that has the whole of the history uh, of, uh, of England in, it, in uh, I think it's 111 pages. And actually in some ways, I think most of it appeared in Punch first of all, and in some ways uh, it's a forerunner of uh, the wit that came out in Monty Python. Anyway, I enjoy the book. So I thought I'd go for dates and targets and bands actually. So. Uh, so here's the uh, here's the book, um, and um, uh, and and I'm just going to go inside just for for a moment actually, and uh, uh, and that's actually not Magna Carta, that's Magna Carta, and you can see the uh, uh, the reason why actually in terms of the cartoon. But um, in this book, uh, it comprises all the parts you can remember, including 103 good things, five bad kings, and two genuine dates, and so that's uh, basically. Uh, the order of what I'm going to be talking about today is, is just a, uh, this is page 30, Richard I was a hairy king with a lion's heart. Uh, so you get some idea of the, of the wit in there, actually. Um, next sentence down, whenever he returned to England, he always set out again immediately for the Mediterranean and was therefore known as Richard Garde de Lyon. Anyway, I find that funny and humorous. And I thought, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, you know, I'll sort of work from here and, uh, uh, and, uh, and so what I'm going to talk about is, t t you know, 2035 and all that, it's a brief look forward, comprising at least one good thing, one bad king, a boy who dreamed he would be king of the world. I guess a number of you know that. Perhaps one good king and only two genuine dates. I'm also going to be talking about how big is really big, and I'm going to be taking aim at an unattainable target. So that's basically the outline of my talk. Uh, so one good thing, and uh, if, if I were live, actually, I'd be now asking you, so who are we talking about here? And of course, it's this man here. Uh, and uh, uh, he, uh, uh, I think, as a young person, a uh, young boy, actually, that was his aim. And, uh, uh, and I think he's still on the way to trying to do that, because uh, uh, this, is, this is good news. And the good news is uh, that, in fact, um, uh, and here's him verbatim, actually, Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he wants to make a big bet on renewables turning the UK into the Saudi Arabia of wind power. I love this one, actually. As regards wind power, Mr Johnson said, this is like a weather forecast. We've got huge, huge gusts of wind going around the north of our country, Scotland. Well, quite extraordinary potential we have for wind. And actually, that would have made it directly into uh, this book here without any translation, in fact. Uh, very amusing, actually. But the important thing here, actually, that I want to say is that, in fact, we do have enough wind, uh, we do have enough solar potential to be able to uh, move ourselves all away from uh, fossil fuels in terms of the energy that we, we require. It's possible to do it. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about solar here. Uh, and this is, um, obviously, it's Australia, and, uh, and the redder it gets, uh, uh, then the sunnier that it is. Uh, and I want to, uh, I'm going to point to, uh, here's the UK to scale, actually, and uh, uh, and we're up in the north of Scotland. Thank goodness it winds because it's it's windy uh, because you can see that from the colour of the turquoise that it's not that sunny uh, a lot of the time. Uh, but uh, uh, you know here we are um, uh, and we're talking about somewhere in the northwest of uh, Australia uh, in the Pilbara, uh, and this is the Asian Renewable Energy Hub. And here's some. I'm going to give you some numbers and then I'm going to unpack the numbers because I don't quite know. You know who you uh, who who the audience is. Uh, you know w you know what uh, whether you're all scientists and engineers. If you are, forgive me. Uh, but um, you know we're going to have. Uh, in the, this is actually progressing now. Uh, Twenty six gigawatts of wind and solar generation. Uh, Twenty three gigawatts for production of green ammonia. And you can say what? Uh, and I'll come back to that later. And up to one hundred terawatt hours of total annual ge annual, annual generation. Now, I mean, if, uh, if you're not aware of gigawatts and terawatts, you might be aware of gigabytes and megabytes and maybe terabytes of storage. Now, these are very big numbers indeed. Uh, and uh, so I want you to look on the right-hand side here, 6,500 kilometers squared. And, and in fact, the solar uh, arrays actually are only in these little, uh, uh, little yellow um, uh, rectangles there. Uh, here's where all the wind is. Uh, and, uh, uh, and to give you a sense of scale, uh, Australia is a great place. Uh, big place. Uh, that it's actually almost exactly the same for we Scots as the size of Perthshire. Uh, if you're English, uh, it's roughly the size of Devon. Uh, and if you're Welsh, you don't have a county big enough. Okay, so is this, this is huge. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, a good part of, uh, uh, you know, a, a huge area, uh, although small, of course, uh, in, uh, in Australian terms. And Australia could, could provide a huge amount of uh, 
uh, solar potential. One of the things that surprised me, you know, about this a huge, you know, uh, facility that's the size uh, of a county. It's in the process of being uh, uh, put uh, together at the moment. Uh, uh, is actually that the majority of the energy comes from wind. So even in the sunniest place on the planet, actually there's a lot of wind. Three quarters wind, one quarter solar. Because the great thing about solar and the pillar is you know when it's coming, but actually you also know when it's not going to be there. Uh, and so most of the solar um, farms actually make big, huge uh, you know, renewable energy generation dumps will have wind there as well. And that's good news for us. We don't really have the solar, but we certainly have the wind. Uh, the map at the top is a wind map. Actually, we had a very, very bright, uh, uh, very dark red, sorry, right up at the top, particularly of Scotland. Uh, so we are one of the windier places uh, on the planet. What's also the case, I say, is although we're a small island, our footprint on the continental shelf, our, uh, our territorial waters are large. And they some of the uh, sorry, Bill, am I the, the only one who can't hear you? Am I the only one who can't hear you? There's something wrong with my sound. Sorry. Okay. All right, okay, so I mean, and again, you probably all know this. I just didn't know who, you know, what the audience was, actually. But when we think of energy, actually, uh, these are uh, two supposedly normal people, actually. We think of calories and how much we're eating and how many calories uh, that we have, actually. And uh, very helpfully, pretty well, in every piece of uh, food that we buy, uh, the energy is there, actually, in terms of calories. It's also there in terms of kilojoules. And uh, so there's a, uh, um, uh, uh, because, you know, we as scientists, uh, we think of things in kilojoules. Um, and um, and you can see the conversion factor there, 2,180 kilojoules is equal to 521 uh, calories. They're actually kilocalories, but we call them calories, and that's confusing. Uh, but there's precisely 4.184 kilojoules in one calorie. And uh, uh, and a, ca a, a, a kilocalorie, a kcal, is the energy required to heat one litre of water uh, by one degree centigrade. Um, I was actually going to do a, a, a little uh, a demonstration in the kitchen about the fact that uh, the kettle that we have is 84% efficient, but uh, I'm going to move on, actually. And, uh, uh, and uh, this is basically chocolate that we're talking about here. There's a huge amount of energy stored in, uh, uh, in, in our food, actually. And, uh, uh, and I wanted to start off with that because um, uh, if we're thinking about uh, boiling water, and that was the, this, this is the slide that I took out, uh, that's operating at three kilowatts. Uh, it uh, took uh, two minutes, 18 seconds, actually, to boil that uh, one litre of water. Um, and, uh, but if we run three kilowatts for 20 minutes, that is one kilowatt hour. So power is in kilowatts. Energy is in, uh, I'm going to do kilowatt hours. I'm going to talk about that as a unit of energy. And one kilowatt hour is actually in equivalent to boiling 8.7 litres of, uh, of water. And we're just going to get bigger from now onwards. Um, and uh, I hope... <laughs> So this is the electricity in our home, and uh, we use between eight and 10 kilowatt hours per day. I mean, on average, it's uh, uh, obviously we're, we're using more at different times of the day, but uh, between 300 and 500 watts. Uh, um, and uh, in terms of uh, if we have gas in our home, we're actually using about four times as much uh, gas, but we're still you know, in the kilowatt hour region. We're talking about things that are, you know, sort of, you know, in terms of size, you know, a bit like a kettle or a bit more than that, or, but then we go to something you know, quite a bit bigger, actually. And this is the Tesla, the Model S, uh, uh, the 100 kilowatt hours in this battery pack, actually, that weighs half a ton and sits underneath uh, the bottom of the car. Uh, and, um, and in fact, actually, because you can actually charge and discharge these batteries very quickly, uh, then you can actually go up to you know, 700 kilowatts um, if you put your foot down. Now, of course, horsepower is power. Uh, and uh, so three kilowatts is basically four uh, horsepower actually so that uh, so you can see because of this big battery and it's only because it's a really big battery that you can discharge very quickly you get this ridiculous uh, horsepower that gives this uh, ludicrous uh, uh, acceleration that they talk about now we're going to go even bigger and this is a triple e container ship this these are the ships that ply the oceans taking uh, the containers uh, 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 from uh, one uh, continent to another and now we're actually talking about gigawatts uh, and gigawatt hours actually, or megawatts and um, and uh, gigawatt hours. So we we're going, you know, we're going up each time when we go to a new unit by a factor of one thousand. Uh, so we're going from one watt hour to a kilowatt hour to a megawatt hour to a gigawatt hour to a terawatt hour, 
Uh, here's the UK, we're into terawatt hours of, uh, uh, of uh, energy, uh, into gigawatts of power. And then if we look at the total number for the planet, uh, according to, you know, going to uh, the BP statistical uh, data to look at this, the planet, the planet runs at 18.5 terawatts. That's the amount of power that's on average in use, um, in a, you know, all the time throughout the year on average. And that actually comes into, in terms of the uh, energy that we use, we're actually up into petawatt hours. So these numbers are absolutely huge. And again, I just wanted to, to show you that uh, if we're thinking about, uh, you know, going up by a factor of a thousand, and unfortunately, um, these two gentlemen uh, are not on the back of the 50 pound note uh, any longer because uh, that's James Watt and uh, Matthew Bolton. But if we stack, uh, um, you know, 50 pounds, uh, we, we stack 20 of them actually on top of each other, uh, then it's a tenth of an inch. That goes up to seven feet five, which is uh, one of the tallest people in China. Um, and then uh, at 1.4 miles, we're up into the uh, uh, into the billion pounds. Uh, we're up into the uh, uh, the giga. And that's actually all the way from um, uh, King's at King Alfred School to, I think it's Lord Nelson. Uh, that's 1.4 miles. And then actually, if you want to go by a factor of a thousand more, it's wantage to Greece. And then a factor of a thousand more, uh, we're talking about 1.4 million miles. That's three Earth to the Moon uh, round trips, actually. So, uh, you know, the numbers, actually, when we're talking about them, you know, it's really, you know, it's difficult to, you know, to conceive just how fast things increase, actually. So these are not uh, in the same way that a, a million, a billion, and a trillion are very different numbers, as we can see here. Uh, but the, uh, the mega and the giga and the tera are very different numbers altogether. Uh, and that's going to be an important point in terms of what I say later. But I'm going to go back to the uh, uh, to the Tesla. This is 100 kilowatt hours. It's one of the big ones. But if you want a, a big range, you need uh, a, you know a big a, a large number of batteries. You need a lot of energy. Uh, and um, and if you're looking at uh, the projection into the future, now this is the best one I've come across uh, uh, from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. It's a very precise. I don't know how you can uh, be so precise in 2030, but basically. Uh, we're talking about uh, 2,000 gigawatt hours per year in 2030 in terms of the amount of battery production. And that's actually not really taking into consideration all the, uh, you know, the hiccups that there could be along the way uh, in terms of actually building up uh, the gigafactories uh, and, uh, and, and opening up the mines and, uh, uh, and, uh, and producing uh, uh, pure enough uh, you know, materials to be uh, used in these batteries. So that's a... That's a, that's a, that's a uh, an optimistic number, um, that's two terawatt hours, 2,000 gigawatt hours <clears throat> is a terawatt hour. But, <clears throat> uh, but um, what uh, I want to show is that if you look um, at the um, uh, top left-hand side here, if I take that uh, uh, two gigawatt hours and I divide that by the 100 kilowatt hours, uh, that's the number of Teslas that I can uh, uh, make in a year. Now, we could double that. Uh, if we go to 50 kilowatt hours, but that's between 15 and 30 million cars per, per year. And uh, in terms of the cars you know, on the road across the planet, uh, we're talking about uh, some of the between one and 1.6 billion uh, cars uh, on the road. So this actually you know, is making an impact, but it's nowhere near taking us uh, to 100% uh, market penetration, uh, uh, certainly across the planet. Uh, and uh, it'll be a very difficult thing to achieve in the in the UK. You never see this number, uh, and it's a simple divide one number by another to give you the number of cars that you can actually make. But it's really going to be very difficult. Uh, but we also want to be able to uh, you know store uh, our electricity in our houses. 13.5 kilowatt hours is one of these Tesla um, uh, battery storage units, um, and uh, you know we could have 150 million of them. But there are uh, several billion. Um, there are some, several billion uh, houses on the planet, and uh, and we want to be able to uh, cool as well as heat. Um, there's also the need to uh, uh, think of uh, you know the you know the other places uh, in the planet, so that uh, uh, one of the things that we've learned from COVID is we're all in uh, one world actually. And uh, uh, and I'll come to at the very end actually the need to be able to look at this as a global thing, and that uh, we pull everybody along together uh, in this move away from uh, carbon uh, uh, and fossil fuels. And uh, if we're talking about fast frequency voltage response, we want to be able to manage this intermittent grid uh, with the irregularities, then you know, batteries are the answer to that, actually. And we need to do this as well. So we simply are not producing enough batteries to do all what we want to use. 
uh, than for actually, and I've not mentioned about buses, I've not mentioned about trains, I've not mentioned about planes, I've not mentioned about ships. There's all these other things to be folded in, and all these actually, as you showed, in, uh, as I showed in previous slides, you know, have a lot more. Uh, they have a lot more need for power. They need a lot more energy to get them across the oceans, for example. So um, I'm going to talk about vacuum. Can you hear me still? Excellent. Right. Okay. So I'm. Uh, I, I, I'm. I'm. I hope you don't mind. I see that I. I'm not going to go. If I go go too quickly, uh, then uh, uh, you know it'll be less understandable. So I'll just go at a steady pace. So uh, uh, I guess. Uh, I mean, again, if it were a, uh, an interactive audience, I'd be asking. So who's the bad king? Okay. Now the bad king actually is not going to come out of this particular thing that bad at all, actually. Um, so uh, here's the bad king. Okay, um, probably doing that at the moment. Uh, and, um, and I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, just actually, I'm going to talk about the middle bit here, actually, alternative facts, actually. And you'll all know uh, about the uh, alternative facts that were presented uh, uh, in terms of the attendance numbers at uh, Donald Trump's inauguration as president of the United States. And they stuck to this one, actually. But of course, you know, it's quite clear uh, that uh, here's, uh, uh, here's Trump's uh, inauguration and uh, uh, and um, and uh, here's Obama's, and uh, it's pretty obvious actually that there were more Obamas, and I'll split that down the middle now actually, and and again it's still very obvious uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know there were far more at Obamas, but he was only he was only misinforming by a factor of three. Okay, I mean that's amateur. I mean it's uh, you know if you're looking in terms of you know what we need in terms of batteries to do all the things that batteries have talked about doing, we need a factor of 20, 30, 40, 50 to be able to do all the challenges. And we're going to struggle uh, just to do cars. And so the, 20, the, the 2035 target of actually going all electric for cars is simply, uh, to me, actually, you know, we don't have the, um, we don't have the, uh, uh, the production capacity. We don't have the minerals. Uh, we haven't opened up the mines. We haven't made the gigafactories. Uh, it's going to be just an impossible task to do only batteries, okay? So I'm going to come back with a solution later. And I want you to remember about that 15 kilowatt hours of a power wall, because if you can work with a smaller range, uh, um, a smaller battery, then we can do it, actually. Uh, anyway, moving quickly on. Okay, so targets, dates, and bans. So the first one that, uh, uh, and this is uh, yeah, on the 18th of May, it was said again, it was going to be 2023, you probably know, uh, but there's a... Uh, the International Energy Authority have actually talked about a global ban uh, by 2025 in terms of new gas boilers, and that's something uh, that uh, uh, that we are, uh, uh, I don't know the exact term, but that certainly it's, it's, it's an intent that the UK goes down uh, that route in terms of no new gas boilers uh, in new builds uh, uh, after um, 2025. Now, that's actually only, what, in four years' time. So that's a big deal. Now, to me, uh, you know, I'm for that, actually, because uh, uh, if we keep on putting in gas boilers, actually, we go down the cul-de-sac uh, of natural gas, which we can't do. Uh, we've, we're no longer going down the cul-de-sac of, uh, of coal, uh, and we need to do that for uh, uh, oil, and we need to do that for, uh, for gas, actually, because net zero really is going to be a challenge uh, if we're using anything, uh, really uh, anything substantial in terms of... Um, uh, in terms of uh, fossil fuels, except for the very hard to uh, uh, to um, uh, to deal with uh, uh, technologies, perhaps like aviation. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Right, okay, so uh, I'm actually using the computer uh, um, uh, microphone now, it's, so it's down there. So uh, I'll just talk a little bit louder. Um, and so this actually came out on the fourth of February last year, but it's been repeated that. Petrol and diesel car sales will be banned uh, from 2035, uh, and that internal combustion engines will be banned with them. Internal combustion engines, actually, if there are zero emissions, are an excellent uh, 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 they're, they're an excellent uh, way of actually producing power. Uh, and the digitized internal combustion engines that are coming out now actually are coming out with 45% efficiency, uh, which at high uh, at high power actually, PEM fuel cells. Uh, uh, do struggle to manage so that uh, I was on a call the other day where somebody was saying that, uh, uh, can you hear me still? Yes, sir. Well, um, that somebody was saying that, uh, um, uh, that internal combustion engines are two or three times uh, less efficient than um, 
uh, than pan fuel cells. That is simply not true. The next generation coming through, uh, the digitized uh, uh, internal combustion engines are actually uh, in a much more efficient than Skyactiv, which I think I can't remember if it's Mazda or, uh, uh, or Honda, I think it's Mazda. Uh, you know, you can actually check out the technology that's coming through. Uh, so that uh, the idea of petrol and diesel cars being banned, uh, that's, that's one thing. Uh, and the internal combustion engine shouldn't be conflated with that. Um, let me see. And, um, and then this uh, article just a few days ago, actually, um, which says why electric cars will take over sooner than you think. There is not one uh, word in that article that actually talks about the, uh, you know, the, the pipeline of the production of lithium batteries. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, this, it, this simply is not, that number is not going to be achieved. And, uh, you know, we're going to, uh, it's going to be more alternative facts in some ways than what Trump did in terms of his uh, inauguration. So that, um, so electric cars on their own, uh, you know, will not be able to, uh, to do the job actually. Uh, and I believe never should be because I think that we should be talking about hybrids. Uh, these hybrids should have a small battery, a 15 kilowatt hour battery like the BMW 330e. Uh, and then we can actually use a good old internal combustion engine and actually work with zero carbon fuels. And I'll come onto that a little bit later as well. And then eventually fuel cells and particularly my favorite is the solid oxide fuel cell. Um, but here again, uh, let me just put this up as well, because one of the things I didn't mention uh, there is that actually it's, it's either an internal combustion engine or an electric vehicle. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, here's another, uh, this is an interesting use of word re re recycling. It's something that we do, uh, we put out our green bins and brown bins, uh, uh, you know, each week actually. Uh, so recycle things, it's a very positive thing to do. This isn't recycling actually, this is decommissioning toxic chemical waste actually. Uh, this is on the same par, actually, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, toxic nuclear waste. There's a huge, huge challenge that we're building up when we don't quite know how to solve it. So there's another issue there, actually, in terms of uh, what do we do uh, with the, uh, the batteries, actually, uh, once their life is finished. The other thing, actually, there's no mention of hydrogen cars in there. And there's a huge um, move, you know, there's a huge um, push in terms of moving, uh, you know, hydrogen forward. But... Uh, uh, if you look in terms of uh, transport, uh, if you're looking in terms of industry, it's a challenge because you produce the hydrogen uh, where the industry isn't. Uh, and so that's an issue of actually transfer, trans, um, uh, transporting the hydrogen. Uh, but if you just look at hydrogen as a, uh, as a, as a fuel uh, for cars, uh, at the end of 2019, I don't have a number to 2020, um, there were 470 refueling stations on the planet. And there was something of the order of about 8,000 uh, hydrogen cars actually in use. So that's, you know, the hydrogen distribution infrastructure isn't there yet. And I've been in any number of meetings actually, where it's really not discussed. Uh, we're talking about putting hydrogen down salt mines uh, um, uh, from, um, a bit, what do we do after that? And uh, are we going to set up a, a hydrogen uh, uh, distribution infrastructure that's uh, hydrogen piping uh, across the country? Well, we might do that in the UK, but very few, Places and the rest of the planet will be doing that. So hydrogen distribution is a challenge. This is uh, something that I wanted to touch on actually because uh, um, the, I, I worked in hydrogen, I've been working in hydrogen, I've been working in batteries since 1980, but uh, working in hydrogen since 2000. Uh, and uh, and I've, I've, I've dropped out what, what you might call the hydrogen only. Uh, yeah. uh, can you hear me? No, I don't know. Hello. I, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. All right, okay, I, could, I, I just heard somebody else's voice there, actually, sorry. Um, but, um, so the hydrogen refueling stations, uh, you need um, uh, five megawatts of power uh, to uh, keep a, you know, a one ton uh, hydrogen refueling station uh, going. Um, uh, so it's, it's a huge, we need a huge amount of you know, power to do that. And there's no point in doing that actually at the moment uh, if we can just use electric. Uh, and you need also to have this incredible purity for PEM fuel cells. And as I say, there's about 700,000, seven and a half thousand tons of hydrogen produced a year at the moment. Uh, and uh, that's enough for 60,000 cars. What I want to talk about, and I mentioned it before actually, because uh, uh, when I'm talking about the Pilbara, they're going to be exporting the, the bottled up sunshine that they're supporting actually, uh, the transporting, sorry, and uh, internationally will be transported on ships 
uh, and it will be ammonia. And that's because ammonia is already produced in huge quantities after cement and steel. It's the largest CO2 uh, uh, per, you know, in, in industry process in terms of, uh, in terms of synthesis. Uh, and uh, you know, the numbers are actually you know, huge here. You know, I'll, I'll go through them quickly, but the important thing here is actually is in 2020, uh, there was an excess of 42 million tons uh, that could have been produced. He's on about hydrogen production now. Um, now this is, this is ammonia production. Okay, so this is ammonia production and there's ammonia transportation because it feeds the planet. Uh, and if you look at the excess capacity uh, that we have, that would actually be sufficient for 60 million cars. So that's a factor of a thousand more than what we have at the moment. And, uh, uh, and what I, uh, am, I guess is the core message in terms of where I am with uh, my, you know, my science and my research is that it's not one or the other. Uh, ammonia and hydrogen are the two uh, zero carbon fuels uh, and uh, you know, they have no carbon in them. It's NH3, nitrogen and three hydrogens or it's H2. And it's a spectrum uh, that we need to work with. And uh, that hydrogen will only succeed uh, if the infrastructure is based upon the ammonia distribution backbone. And that is what's actually happening in the Pilbara. It's happening in Saudi Arabia. It'll be happening in Mauritania, uh, in Morocco, in Chile and elsewhere actually because we know how to transport ammonia around. There's 25 million tons of it transported around each year already. But what I wanted to say actually is that, you know, if we, we will want to perhaps convert some of that ammonia back to hydrogen, that's a straightforward thing to do. And it's part of, uh, uh, you know, our research uh, uh, group at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Harwell and uh, at SDSC and, uh, and in Oxford that we're working on. Uh, so if we convert, um, the ammonia partly to hydrogen, then we are actually winning and doing something that's better than ammonia on its own, than hydrogen on its own. And so let me, um, here's uh, alkaline fuel cells. We have one of the world leaders in alkaline fuel cells. I won't say too much about that, but I wanted to, uh, to pick up on uh, solar oxide fuel cells at the end there. Again, I don't want to go into too much of the technology. The important thing I wanted to say is that uh, uh, this is work that we're doing with reaction engines. Uh, uh, we um, uh, we're working with them actually uh, to, uh, to, to basically convert 30% uh, of our ammonia to hydrogen. And that ammonia hydrogen mixture is not one or the other, it's together, um, is actually uh, in, terms, in, in terms of uh, per unit uh, air aspirating through the, uh, the jet engine is actually essentially the same in terms of flame speed and in terms of entropy, in terms of all the dynamic quantities that you would want to think of uh, is actually uh, very similar to jet fuel. The trouble is actually you're aspirating through twice the amount of fuel. So the range is, uh, let's say about 40% of, uh, of what you would get, but this is actually retrofitting. This is gonna be a big point of what I want to see uh, in terms of messages that I want to leave you with actually. This is retrofitting existing technology. Uh, we can store ammonia in LPG and converted LPG four cores. There's a thousand of these in the UK already. Um, but if we're looking at uh, uh, maritime, uh, then uh, the first of my engines are actually coming out in uh, 2023, 2024. And that engine actually is a two-stroke engine, uh, produces a huge amount of power, as I showed you in one of the earlier slides. And it's the size of a three-story building. It's absolutely huge. And it runs on ammonia. Small, you know, there's a small, um, actually at the moment, diesel uh, uh, pilot, flame that, uh, pilot flame that you actually produce, but you can actually do that with a small amount of uh, cracked hydrogen. So that actually deals with the maritime uh, um, you know, the maritime challenge. Uh, and as see, if you look at the amount of production in terms of tons of ammonia, it's huge. Um, and um, then there's the internal combustion engine, as I said before, the digitized uh, uh, hydraulic and in internal combustion engines where you take off the camshaft and you do it all by digitized hydraulic valves, all controlled wirelessly. That actually gives you a huge uh, efficiency gain actually over what's there already. And that's, uh, that to me is actually, you know, the way in which we should be moving forward. Uh, that uh, we, you know, if we can retrofit technologies uh, and convert them from carbon-based fuels to zero carbon fuels, and if we, if we work on the existing infrastructures, that then we have, uh, uh, you know, a huge opportunity to be able to make you know, a different transition from the one that's been talked about at the moment. Um, and uh, it's, you know, and, and I'm talking about no, no single solution, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the car and the truck should be part battery, part zero carbon fuel. It should be a hybrid. Uh, where you basically replace the petrol or the diesel uh, with, uh, and my favorite would be ammonia. And I can talk about the 
safety of ammonia to the cows come home actually, but uh, um, but uh, you know one of the main focuses of our group is actually developing these uh, ammonia cracker technologies. Uh, the one that we're doing with reaction engine is actually going to be in wing uh, for a, a powering uh, a jet plane. That's the hardest challenge. Uh, but um, these uh, uh, crackers actually allow us to explore the whole spectrum of zero carbon fuels. So I'm coming to the the end here actually, and uh, um, what I wanted to uh, uh, to talk about was uh, COP26 uh, and the challenges that we face actually. And uh, uh, and uh, here I see I've got uh, uh, you know perhaps a, a good thing. Yeah. So um, certainly perhaps uh, so you know they're, they're, you know things uh, things are much more hopeful than before and. Uh, uh, you know, we have a, a president in the United States who, who, who recognizes the challenges uh, uh, that we face, actually. But uh, I want to say a little bit about this because another uh, success story, actually, is that, we, that our society, actually, have gone and talked to all the national academies in the G7 countries and beyond. Uh, and we've actually gone and, and with a consensus, although France and uh, Germany don't agree on nuclear, for example, but there's a consensus in moving forward in terms of the urgency uh, of what we should be doing so that... Uh, uh, the, uh, the website's down at the bottom there if you want to uh, check out these, uh, um, these different uh, um, short uh, um, you know, briefings that we've got in there, actually. But, uh, uh, but there's a consensus uh, amongst um, you know, academics, anyway, in terms of the advice that we want to give uh, to, the, uh, uh, to, the, to G7 that's happening now that, and also uh, to COP26, uh, you know, when it happens, that... Uh, we need to have a concerted view in terms of what we can advise, because as we've learned through COVID, uh, you know, the advice of, uh, of scientists and engineers and technologists is incredibly important in terms of, uh, uh, you know, moving forward in, in a way that's uh, going to be um, 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 you know, work, do more work. So very quickly uh, through here, you know, we have uh, briefings on uh, uh, next generation climate models. We need to improve those, particularly with the huge uh, uh, different uh, weather cycles that we get and, the, uh, and, and, the, uh, and these major events that are difficult to predict. Then there's the carbon cycle, uh, climate, climate resilience and adaptation. These are three reports that have come out. Uh, land, food and health, uh, nourishing 10 billion sustainably. That is something that we must do. Uh, and uh, we're talking about a healthy planet so that uh, zero emissions is an absolute necessity in terms of uh, uh, the, um, the uh, way we produce uh, our, and use our fuels in the future. You know, emissions you just have to hit zero. Um, uh, and that uh, there's also the impact of climate change and, and land. Um, computing for net zero and, uh, and then policy options and economic perspectives. Uh, so again, uh, you know, there will be a, a need to transform the uh, economic systems, if only in terms of bringing in something uh, like a carbon tax, actually. But, uh, um, and again, I'm just putting these up, the, the um, the websites down there, actually. And then the last one, which is uh, where, uh, where I've been talking about uh, uh, today, actually, uh, is that there are four briefings, actually, uh, next generation batteries. And there's a huge challenge there. As I was in the group that, uh, uh, that invented the lithium battery way back in 1980, and it doesn't look an awful lot different uh, today, actually. It is improved, and the, the materials haven't changed that much. The technology has, but there's a limit to what we can actually do. Um, and we're not going to get uh, we're not going to get a factor of ten or or anything in terms of uh, energy density uh, uh, very easily. And in fact, we don't need to because we have hydrogen and ammonia, zero carbon fuels uh, that will meet that set net zero challenge. And, and that container ship will be uh, there'll be one of these running uh, on ammonia in uh, in 2024. Uh, CO2 capture and storage that's that's our intermediate solution, and it has to be an intermediate solution. And that's a challenge of morphing from what we call blue. Um, 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 you know, blue um, ammonia, blue hydrogen, uh, you know, blue batteries uh, through to, uh, uh, to, to, to through the green where we have no carbon uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the mix at all. So carbon, you know, CO2 capture and storage is important, but it's not something that we should be leaning on, uh, uh, you know, for our future. And we also need to go for low carbon heating and, and cooling uh, and, uh, you know, sitting in the conservatory here, right, or standing in the conservatory here. It's quite clear, you know, that we are going to have warmer summers, and uh, and the uh, the planet is uh, is heating up, <clears throat> and we have to find a way that doesn't involve natural gas. Uh, that's a necessity, and I think that hydrogen uh, is a is a poor option for this, actually, personally, and that we should be looking for electric uh, options. And there are a number of those. Of course, the heat pumps are one of them, 
uh, but that's only one of the possible solutions that we could be using. And so that's me really at the end. I kind of raced through. I apologize for that actually after all the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the issues that we had at the beginning. Um, and I, you know, I've got two genuine dates actually, and, uh, um, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, um, you know, I'll give you a chance to mull about what you think that the two important dates are uh, in this whole story. Um, and uh, I'll give you a moment. Uh, uh, I've just chosen, uh, not, not randomly, there's a reason why I've chosen these two dates, actually. Um, one of them is in the past and one of them is in the future. Uh, the one that's in the past is 1769. And that's the year, 4th of January, that uh, uh, James Watt actually patented his, his, his efficient steam engine. At that point, you had a, you had a, a machine uh, that could outperform a horse. It was more than one horsepower. As soon as you have a machine uh, that goes uh, more than one horsepower, you don't need the horse and you can build and build and build. And we've done that in a remarkable way. But the backbone for that has been coal and oil and gas. And um, here's James Watt again. And um, the other date is 2050. That is the end uh, of our dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, and uh, 2035 and, 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 and doing impossible promises where we know that we're not going to have enough batteries, but nobody talks about it in that way, uh, that uh, we need to move away from false targets that are not going to be achievable and look at all the different technologies that we can to be able to you know, get, our, get ourselves there actually and not reply, not, and, not, um, and not wait for, uh, you know, for, you know, for um, minor miracles to happen in technologies that we already trust. And we need to look at all the options. And for me, you know, the most important one actually is we got wind and solar, we, we might have a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, hydro uh, and, um, uh, and in terms of the, the, the fuels so that we can actually, uh, you, know, do, you know, we can actually decouple supply and demand it's batteries for short term, uh, and it's, uh, I mean, it's ammonia for the big things, and I have a feeling uh, that hydrogen could well get squeezed out, uh, unfortunately, unless we get to the VHS beta max uh, moment, but uh, with that, uh, I'll finish, uh, and uh, thanks for listening. Bill, uh, hey, thank you so much, and um, uh, uh, so many nuggets, home truths, revelations in there uh, uh, but thank you so much for your perseverance and um uh, the the wantage nobel prize is heading your way uh, for that persistence uh, you know it was so worthwhile that we did persist and get uh, through those bumps in the road before speaking yeah. of nobel prizes um it, it, it's never possible to do your cv justice but you kind of alluded to a journey your personal journey through the world of energy and energy storage and it, it kind of starts with a Nobel Prize winning group um, and then moves uh, again I'm not doing it justice to hydrogen and and has really seriously moved to ammonia which comes through very strongly from yeah. your talk do you want to just say a little bit more about that um, and then we'll try and pick up the uh, questions um, okay, well, I mean, I, I'm not anti-hydrogen, I'm anti-hydrogen only. Um, there's, I mean, everything's about hydrogen. I was sat in a meeting uh, two days ago, actually, and there, you know, there was a little bit of mention about ammonia, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it's almost like the Voldemort of uh, hydrogen. It's, it's the name that cannot be uttered, actually. So, I mean, I push hard on ammonia, but not because I want, to, I want it to find its proper role. And there's a role of uh, ammonia with hydrogen, certainly in the internal combustion engine and in jet engine. But also, you know, half my group actually is looking at uh, sodium batteries uh, because sodium batteries are sustainable and, uh, uh, and, 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 and safer uh, than lithium batteries. And, uh, and you know, there's, it's much, you know, they, um, uh, there's much more resource availability as well. Uh, and we've been working with Fradian, which is a, a UK based company. Uh, and, uh, you, know, that's, uh, so, uh, you know, that's, you know, the way I see things moving forward uh, uh, and that, uh, uh, that, you know, that sodium batteries, certainly for static storage, uh, uh, you know, will perform as well as lithium batteries in the future. So it's, it's actually, it's, you know, it's all of it together. Um, but um, uh, just going back to it, it's interesting because I was thinking about, you know, good people and bad people and, and all that, actually. And, uh, you know, my, you know, I have uh, in my career actually been very fortunate because uh, John Goodenough, who was my supervisor, he got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. So John's 99 uh, uh, on the 25th of July this year. 
I've actually been asked to write his pre-obituary, which is a very difficult thing to do. But it did give me a chance really to, you know, to, I knew, I knew the man, but just to, he's a man who's at 99 years old, still going into the lab most days. I mean, he is, he's always had a small group and he's passionate about making a difference. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's people like that, that that spur you on, actually. And, uh, and just looking for what is, uh, you know, questioning everything. And, uh, and, and some of these things I said tonight you know, may well turn out being wrong. But we shouldn't just go down what the latest fad is. And that's, unfortunately, uh, the way in which it seems to be happening at the moment with Hansen being pushed uh, so hard, actually, uh, and uh, without any infrastructure to talk about it. And uh, everything's going to be put down a salt mine. And then what we do with it after that, I don't know. Uh, so, um, um, so um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wandering around now, I see. But I've moved my emphasis, my research, basically once every five years. Uh, uh, and uh, I've not given up on Hansen at all. Uh, but it's uh, it's because it is part of the story. We're cracking on money apparently to hide, and that's the main interest of what we're doing in the group. Uh, but um, uh, you know, it's a bit of it all actually, and uh, uh, and it's important that we try all these things actually and uh, and move forward. And and retrofitting is actually the only way uh, things are going to work for the uh, for the developing well, like low and middle income countries. Actually, they're not going to be running around in Teslas uh, or the equivalents. Actually, that's just not possible. But we can actually have emission-free vehicles that are actually using efficient, modernized technologies. When people say the internal combustion engine should be, you know, should be thrown into the uh, bin, actually, it's something of the past. The ones that are coming through now are just quite remarkable. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm just going to questions. Now, one uh, spotted here, and I have no chance of getting to them all because the chat box is full of stuff about the internet and Zoom and <laughs> whatever. Um, but a uh, question I, I think relevant, how close is the research into hydrogen and ammonia link to commercial businesses who can make it a reality? I'm going to sense uh, <laughs> um, the, the uh, interesting answer there. Right, okay. So the answer to that one is actually with our crackers, uh, um, you know, the um, we're working with reaction engines, so we're going through a second proof of concept. Um, we have um, uh, we have um, uh, investor funding um, uh, for the next step, um, and that um, uh, and that uh, you know, I mean, I can't see what, what it is that we're doing, but uh, we have a target of uh, uh, something that's actually very visible, uh, that's UK based for COP26, and then after that, there'll be you know, there'll be further investment, and in order for my YouTube more just to take that further. Well, that's on the ammonia cracker side of things. Uh, uh, we've also, I mean, I'm looking to get funding uh, at, uh, at the Rutherford lab so that, uh, you know, we can actually build up a demonstrator facility that's working at uh, uh, using the megawatts of PV that we're putting on our roofs and actually bringing in companies and actually allowing them to be able to demonstrate things at the megawatt, megawatt hour level uh, and actually build up the technology. So that's as a, as a national laboratory, you know, it's, it's trying to be responsible in terms of helping uh, you know, companies in the UK get uh, you know beyond the valley of death through the you know, technical readiness levels of four to seven, and so we're trying to establish that and do that in a coherent way. And you know about that, John, anyway. But uh, uh, so we are trying to really try to enable because that's absolutely crucial. There's no point you having an idea; uh, it has to be translated into something that works, and all the health and safety and uh, regulatory stuff has to be done. And, uh, and and we need to get that done definitely. By the way, the company Reaction Engines that Bill mentioned, not everybody may know, but they're based at Cullum and their mission uh, is to produce uh, an engine called Sabre. It's, I think the, the, the ABR bit is air breathing uh, rocket engine, the kind of thing that can get you from Heathrow to Sydney in five minutes or uh, oh, no. Maybe a bit longer, but um, <laughs> and it's, and it's, it's also it's also low space flight actually, what uh, low space flight. Uh, so what uh, uh, you know what uh, you know, Virgin Galactic and others are doing at the moment, they're doing that uh, uh, you know routinely with a with a with a basically with a with a rocket engine. Yes. Yeah. And there's another commercial example comes to mind. Um, uh, down in Didcot, there's a what they call an air separation plant. Um, where air goes in one end and trucks of liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen go out the other end. It's run by a company called Air Products, who uh, are planning to 
use solar energy in Saudi Arabia um, to produce ammonia um, in such quantities, uh, we might not quite know what to do with it in four or five years' time. Yeah, well, the thing is, we, you know, we, but we, you know, I mean, we, I mean, the technology is actually, I mean, most of the technology is sitting at uh, uh, pre-commercial. I mean, it's matter, it's matter of, it's just a matter of putting things together. So, for example, transporting uh, green ammonia around the planet is no different from transporting, uh, you know, brown ammonia. I mean, the, you know, a lot of the, the regulatory aspects of that are all sorted out with the IMO already. So some things can move very quickly, um, and they have to actually. But uh, and then we have to overcome public acceptance because that's the number one challenge with ammonia. People say we don't want to work with it because it's not safe, and yet it's got a hundred-year track record. Uh, you know, <laughs> that you don't hear about it in the news. And uh, you know, there's as much, I think there's half as much ammonia produced as plastics each year. It's just huge. But um, anyway. there was one question about what is a digitized internal combustion engine. Uh, which I think actually you answered, Bill, and it was essentially, as I understood, retrofitting um, or, or using uh, reciprocating engines, piston engines, not dissimilar to petrol or diesel engines. Um, right, so, with can, so the so the, the um, uh, you know the company that um, uh, you know, I, I first heard this in. The, in 2013, I met a guy called Eddie Sturman. I see he's gone and converted Cummins engines, marine engines, standard engines. Actually, you take off the, the head, uh, no camshaft, actually, the digital hydraulic valves, and they're all controlled, uh, you know, remotely by a little, you know, Raspberry Pi or whatever. Uh, and um, there's a video. I see if you if you Google, uh, you know, Eddie Sturman and uh, Ode to Joy, uh, you'll actually come up with a, uh, a you know, that that tells you te the technology. And uh, I heard this first in 2013, and he was. So basically, you're face shifting all the cylinders and uh, uh, and doing uh, in, you know, a, a nicely you know, the, the um, uh, well just you know and actually going up and you know, going up in the RPM and down again. And uh, I think it's four and a half minutes actually into the talk actually. He turns his uh, he turns his internal combustion engine into an organ and plays O to join on the internal combustion engine. That's the level of control. And so you know, we can actually, I mean, basically you know with with diesels you can you can do no notches. You just got to Choose the temperature, which is going to be lower because it's not spark emission; it's compression emission. You've got to get the compression right, uh, and uh, and uh, and the uh, and, and the temperature right. And then you know, there are sweet spots there actually where you minimise the NOx emissions. And one of the other things that we're doing actually using uh, um, uh, using uh, um, you know um, RAL based technology is actually uh, you know is properly zeroing that emissions actually so that uh, you prevent as much emissions as you can in the engine and you uh, cure uh, you know the Anything that comes down, actually, and so we're looking for we're looking for uh, a thousand times lower than what we have at the moment. And uh, you know, talking to the people uh, you know involved in agriculture and the likes, then we need to get down to selling for money to parts per billion. Wow, that almost answers uh, another question in the chat from Ken. Uh, uh, when you were talking about ammonia, does I guess burning ammonia does it produce much nitrogen dioxide? Like Right. Okay. So, and um, the answer to that one is that uh, you have to, if you choose, you know, the, if you choose a seventy-two twenty-eight um, mixture, uh, then uh, of, uh, that's ammonia and hydrogen, or that's ammonia and crypto uh, and crypt ammonia. Then uh, uh, you know the, the NOx levels are actually lower uh, than uh, if you actually work with um, natural gas. Uh, so what 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 actually happens is that uh, if you're slightly ammonia rich. And then uh, the ammonia, because add blue, I mean, ammonia is the uh, reactor, is the active part of add blue, which is actually used uh, to clean the noxes up out in the exhausts that, uh, uh, you know, of lorries and now of cars. Uh, then um, the ammonia actually, uh, you know, captures the, uh, or reacts with the noxes within the uh, engine cylinder if it's slightly ammonia rich. And that actually goes to nitrogen and water. So essentially, what you're doing is you're doing the equivalent of add blue actually in the cylinder. So you've got to get it right, uh, but um, uh, but certainly, I mean, I know that with these digitized engines, uh, uh, you've got um, you've got millis you've got, actually you've got a few microsecond control of uh, what's going on actually with this digital injection. So it, it really is, you know, everything is done intracycle actually. You know, so we you know we're monitor you know we, we know th th these have been monitored uh, you know you know, it, you know half a dozen times a dozen times actually within a single engine cycle, 
So uh, and it's all just wirelessly controlled, as we find. The night actually wirelessly controlled on a hot day may not work. <laughs> Well, I guess, I, 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 by the way, I think you've done it amazing. Um, our normal curfew time is quarter to nine. Uh, we're just yeah. heading there now. And given all the grief we <laughs> went through at the beginning, I think it's fantastic what you've delivered in the time we had. Um, with Faith not being on the call, I haven't a clue what we're doing next month to give a shout out and announce uh, that. But um, if I may, uh, uh put a kind of a closing question to you um mm -hmm. to bring things to wards an end tonight um don't know about you but i've uh struggled to find glasgow a particularly appealing place in november uh in the past um so um with cop 26 coming up that's clearly um one antidote answer to that, but um, COP26 being within the United Kingdom this year, uh, it's it must be an opportunity. But is it the kind of event that the man at the bus stop like me can get to, or do I need to be a fellow of the Royal Society to get in, or what, um, what would you say to that? What I say to that is actually number two. So I actually went to COP24 uh, in Katowice in Poland. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and we ended up uh, in the UK pavilion, and it's a sideshow. Uh, all the uh, you know all the brokering, all the talking about the single word in a document, and like that, that's actually going on in COP26. And the rest of it is a uh, is a sideshow actually. So that even you know when we went in there, we were we were we weren't we, well, there were maybe one or two politicians that dropped in the, uh, to the uh, to the base uh, um, to the base pavilion, but uh, uh, no, I mean. It's a uh, uh, it's a very private event actually, and um, you know all the ho well, actually a lot of the horse trading is probably done beforehand. But uh, you know we were just the uh, uh, you know the uh, you know the beauty pageant in a way. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Well, hey, um, I, I uh, so sorry to any folks whose questions did get buried in some of the noise that, that came through, but uh, I think it is time to draw the line and Bill to say thank you so much uh, for uh, really, really terrific insights um, uh, and and for sure the perseverance coming through. You, you're um, welcome to Wantage uh, yeah, at any time. <laughs> well, I know how far it is to walk across Wantage in there, it's 1.4 miles. <laughs> and uh, uh, Look forward to seeing you on the on Harwell campus or, or anywhere. Um, for now, from all of us, thank you very, very much indeed. Thanks, Bill. See you soon. Thanks. Good night, everybody.